Hello and welcome to my recorded presentation for the CESRAC Conference 2021. My name is Mayuri Rao and I'm presenting on behalf of the members of the CMB Distortion Lab at the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore, India. The title of my talk is Combating Systematics, Ground-Based versus Space-Based Global EOR Experiments. I will present an overview of the challenges that typically face most global EOR signal detection experiments with an emphasis on how our group aims to tackle some of these challenges in two experiments. First, a quick overview of the global 21 centimeter signal. The global 21 centimeter signal traces the average evolution of neutral hydrogen over cosmic time, over the cosmic dawn, and the epoch of reionization. The astrophysics and cosmology over cosmic dawn and reionization determines the specific shape and strength of the EOR signal. Typical standard models predict that the signal is a few tens of milli kelvins in brightness temperature, and this is compared to photons that are dominated by galactic synchrotron emission that have strengths that are about four to six orders of magnitude brighter. In addition to this natural challenge to signal detection, it is non-trivial to design and implement an experiment that is capable of detecting such a broad and weak signal. For some context, this figure gives an idea of the forest of signals predicted by standard cosmology here and the extremely broad and deep signal reported by the EDGES group in their 2018 Nature paper. Thus, the parameter space is very much open for the global EOR detection experiments. There are a slew of experiments listed here that are seeking a confident detection of the global EOR signal. Two experiments from our group are SARAS and Pratush. SARAS stands for Shaped Antenna Measurement of the Background Radio Spectrum. It is a mature ground-based experiment and has been observing over several deployments, recently finished ob observing in its third generation, namely SARAS-3. Pratush, on the other hand, is a more recent experiment from our group. Pratush stands for Probing Reionization of the Universe Using Signal from Hydrogen. It is a proposed space-based experiment to observe and detect the global 21 centimeter signal in the far side of the moon, and it is currently funded for pre-project studies by the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. Before going on to the details, it is important to understand how the instrument itself affects measurements in global EOR signal experiments. I will broadly classify the effect of the instrument on the measurement as multiplicative and additive. Multiplicative effects are usually things such as the transfer function of the receiver, that is basically its response to a signal as a function of frequency. These are generally calibrated or corrected by the bandpass calibration procedure. This involves introducing a flat or a spectrally well-defined signal, something like a broadband noise source, through the same electronics and thus correcting for the effect of this multiplicative effect in your final data set or measurement. The second and the slightly more subtle as well as challenging to correct effects are the additive effects. As the name suggests, these are additive contaminants to the sky signal. They are more difficult to model or correct for, and usually the best one can do is to use approximate analytical functions for the expected additive effects, such as a sine wave for a standing wave pattern, for example, or use some measurements that have been made either in situ or in the lab to correct for or subtract these additive effects out. More broadly though, I will define for the purposes of this talk what I mean by systematics. Systematics here stand for instrumental or environmental effects that have a non-zero mean, thus on averaging the signal even further, what you, you, the noise itself might go down, such as thermal Gaussian random noise. However, the systematics remain in the data. And the most challenging form of systematic is one which very much looks like or resembles a signal but it's not the true cosmological signal, hence results in a confusion, confusion or a confused detection or a false positive signal. Some more examples of systematics or causes of systematics are listed on this slide here. For example, um, reflections between poorly matched components uh, in the signal chain can result in standing wave patterns. Uh, this is an additive systematic that can confuse or hinder signal detection. Another example is from the inherent feature or shape that is present in the coupling of the antenna to the sky. This is often characterized by the antenna's return loss parameter. Furthermore, a frequency dependent antenna, that is an antenna whose beam changes as a function of frequency, can introduce a spectral structure due to spatial structure. 
By this I mean that when the antenna points towards different sources in the sky at different frequencies, essentially the spatial structure in the sky shows up as a feature, as an artificial feature in the measured spectrum. Some more examples are improper modeling of the data itself as well as the ionosphere. So these are a few more examples of what can introduce systematics in the measurement. Just as there was a forest of uh, data or signals that can be predicted by standard cosmology, there is a forest of systematics within which most EOR detection experiments operate. These are represented here uh, as an overview, and this probably is, this is not really exhaustive in any way. There could very well be many more uh, systematics uh, that are specific to a certain experiment or instrument. So we look at how uh, SARS, in particular SARS-3 and Pratush, uh, operate under these constraints and aim to combat uh, the systematics that I just listed. There are some common design principles with which uh, SARS-3 as well as Pratush are designed. Um, starting with, we use something called as maximally smooth functions, which are in effect functions that don't have uh, inflections in high order derivatives. So we use these MS functions to quantify both simulations and measurements. And we use this as a check on how our instrument is behaving at various stages uh, in the design stage, in the measurement, as well as in the data analysis process. Furthermore, we simulate and measure the antenna beam to adhere to some strict uh, requirements for frequency independence. And typically for this purpose, we use something known as an electrically small antenna, which seems to have uh, properties conducive to frequency independence. Furthermore, we uh, simulate and measure the return loss of the antenna, that is the coupling of the sky to the antenna, to ensure that the effective sky that comes through the antenna does not have any artificial features or ripples that can confuse the signal detection. The calibrated pan pass response of the instrument is extensively measured in the lab, and the data is averaged to obtain the desired sensitivity, such that at the final stage before deployment, we are confident that the instrument itself does not have any confusing spectral structures to the millikelvin levels. We minimize all cable lengths to avoid uh, confusing standing wave cycles, and we put our data through extensive statistical tests, use physical sky models for um, um, calibration and measurement, as well as smooth functions to fit and analyze our data. With that overview, I'll quickly go over the various challenges that are uh, alleviated by such design principles. In green are all the effects that uh, the SARS-3 as well as Pratush will overcome by these design principles. In blue are the slightly more subtle effects that we have to pay extra attention to, as well as um, these are the more unknown unknowns. So we are always very careful when making statements about these effects. SARS-2 was the first experiment to place constraints on the astrophysics of the first sources. However, the efficiency of the SARS-2 antenna was limited due to ohmic losses by coupling to the ground beneath it. That is the physical earth or the soil beneath the antenna itself. SARS-3 overcomes this limitation by placing the antenna over uh, fresh water of sufficient depth. We usually do this by deploying in relatively radio quiet locations that have large freshwater lakes with sufficient depth. And as we see here in these plots, these are measurements of the efficiency of the SARS-2 antenna that have improved significantly, SARS-3 antenna, I apologize, right, that have improved significantly over the efficiency of the SARS-2 antenna. Thus, by moving the antenna from the earth to a water body, we have alleviated the issue of losses uh, due to the earth beneath the antenna. So here are some nice pictures of the SARS-3 antenna observing over a water body. And these are some papers that have either been recently published or that you can watch out for in the near future from SARS-3. So here, are, here is the improved systematics forest for SARS-3. And as I mentioned, uh, we have reduced the coupling to the earth. We have taken care of coupling to sky in the antenna design phase. And we also take care of the self-generated RFI from the digital electronics by placing the antenna at a large distance uh, away from the digital receiver that can introduce some um, self-generated radio frequency interference. The antenna as well as the digital electronics are separated in distance uh, up by about 100 meters, and the receiver itself is placed in a heavily shielded enclosure. Pratush, on the other hand, 
who will overcome the limitation of radio frequency interference from the environment by observing in the very radio quiet region in the far side of the moon. However, the challenges that face the Pratush antenna design are that it is extremely challenging to design an antenna with the frequency independent characteristics that we require when it is placed right above or uh, right in the proximity of a metallic structure, such as a satellite bus. The other challenge which is very critical is um, the EMI shielding of the electronics, whereas in this case, we are not able to separate the antenna and the electronics by running a cable of 100 meter length uh, and also converting from uh, radio frequency to optical fiber regime. So these are two challenges uh, in the Pratosh design that we are currently focusing on, and we are uh, iterating over several uh, designs to overcome these challenges. So this is the systematics forest for Pratosh, where the antenna design as well as the self-generated EMI remain a challenge. However, by moving the uh, antenna and moving the experiment from Earth to free space, we have again alleviated the challenge of coupling to the Earth. There is no environmental radio frequency interference. And the other solutions such as data analysis method, et cetera, remains common to SARS or other ground-based experiments from our group. So in summary, there are several potential sources of confusion to global EOR signal detection. SARS and Pratush both have an instrument design based on an underlying principle of smoothness in the calibrated bandpass. SARS has overcome this by moving uh, some of the uh, systematics by moving from ground-based to water-based measurements. However, even the most radio quiet locations still have some lingering RFI and low lying RFI is only visible uh, when we integrate the signal sufficiently. It is always safer to move to a region that is completely uh, RFI free. For this, Pratush is a proposed uh, experiment to observe over the far side of the moon, which is extremely radio quiet. There are some other known instrumental challenges that our team is working on addressing, such as modeling the antenna and the presence of a bus, as well as shielding of the electronics from self-generated uh, RFI. As always, these are known unknowns, but they are easier to handle than the unknown unknowns. So Saras and Patish together can provide a complementary and robust measurement for a robust signal detection. Thank you very much.